Hi, this is Paul. A lot of my videos lately have been working on a big project that I've been working on for a very long time, trying to account for the free fall of the main line and the kind of sledding that happens in secularity. Uh, two of the books that I've been paying a lot of attention to lately, High on God, on my last video, I, I delved into a little bit of what James Wellman discovered when he moved from Chicago to Seattle and was looking for all of these mega progressive mega churches that he imagined would be flourishing in the very politically uh, progressive American West Coast and finding really none as especially as compared to the conservative churches and I've talked a fair amount about that in the past there's many many different dynamics that go into this and also continuing to read George Yancey's and Ashley Quasix, is that how to say her name? I don't know. Uh, One Faith No Longer, The Transformation of Christianity in Red and Blue America. And you get to the end, I still want to do a commentary, maybe I'll do it today. You get to the end of the, the Sean McDowell, George Yancey conversation, and basically Sean McDowell asks, can these two continue to share this label called Christianity? And Yancey's answer, well, I'll, I'll not give Yancey's answer. I'll give my answer. The basic answer is no. And someone's going to abandon the label. And it's not hard to see which side will abandon the label. And part of where Yancey's book is helpful is it gives a lot of indications about why some abandon the label. And I think it also gives some sort of contemporary understanding of the dynamics of secularity and why it um, tends to, why, why we see what we see in terms of churches. Now, someone commented in one of my videos that, you know, that there should be a podcast, the rise and fall of the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast. And I very much, I mean, it's, it's, Sometimes reading my comment section is like listening to the Oracle at Delphi. I was listening to the rest of history, and they've they've got a fun one on um, Thermopylae and Salamis, and they were talking about the 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 Spartans and the Athenians going to the Oracle at Delphi, hearing that the Persians are coming, and you know they get their these cryptic answers. But um, so sometimes my comment section feels like the Oracle of Delphi because I, I read that in the comment section and I knew exactly what the commenter was meaning because I feel that way. When I, when I first started listening to the rise and fall of Mars Hill, seemed like a revelation and then, you know, the pace, of course, I had a whole bunch of them queued when I went on vacation and so I listened to a whole bunch of them in a row and now they're coming out every two weeks and the last one I heard, I, I was... I had a lot of thoughts on that. I haven't really done any commentary on them directly, but especially the one on um, on demons, I thought was there was a lot to say about that podcast. There are some again, as with that podcast, there's some stuff that was really excellent in it, and other stuff that's like part of what comes out. So you again, we're going to talk about you have the seeker movement. Part of what comes out, the seeker movement really grows out of, in a lot of ways, the, politis, the, the politicization of the 80s. The 1980s and the moral majority, there was sort of this revivification of conservatism in America, partly be, obviously because of the Reagan revolution, but in Christianity led by, you know, Jerry Falwell, Reed, the religious right, and of course then religious progressives, you know, really pushed back against that. So you had the polarization and has been the pattern. Seekers sort of inherited the mantle of Bill Hybels and Rick Warren sort of inherit the mantle of Billy Graham. And the seeker movement becomes the new neo-evangelical. Now, Christianity today is the old neo-evangelical, but the dynamics within the neo-evangelical of trying to hold together the tension of the fundamentalists and the modernists, 
these things continue to hold. And as is usually the case, as I see happening in the Christian Reformed Church, you have this this pulling on one hand of the main line and of the other hand of fundamentalism, evangelicalism. And remember, this is all on a spectrum. We're going to talk about that. And a lot of more conservative people who listen to the rise and fall of Mars Hill feel the feel the gravitational force of the main line pulling on progressive evangelicalism. And, you know, when you look at my conversation with Tripp, I mean, that's what that's what triggered Trip. That's what is triggering a lot of people about this podcast. That's what's triggering people about Christianity Today. Now, again, Christianity Today continues to sort of walk this middle line. Christianity Today isn't going to go... So when I was young, I used to have a subscription to The Other Side, which was a progressive, evangelical, uh, very, fairly connected with, especially with Anabaptist traditions, because the Anabaptist tradition really got an energy boost during the Vietnam War. They had hard times during the Second World War because to to be a conscientious objector in the Second World War, that was hard stuff. And there's a great movie about that. To be a conscientious objector in the Vietnam War, well, you're just in alignment with the rest of the culture. And so I was reading Sojourners. I was reading The Other Side. And I remember when The Other Side flipped or basically came out as pro-LGBTQ. It wasn't, you didn't have all those alphabets back then. But it was like, oh, that's interesting. And I haven't read Sojourners in a long time. I would imagine they're at least friendly, if not affirming. I mean, it's just sort of the trajectory of sojourners. And so a lot of people, again, we, we, we recognize patterns. A lot of people are looking at Christianity today, and they listen to guys like Sky Jatani and Phil Visser, who are, you know, they're, they're just trying to stay on the other side of that line, but they kind of want to come as close as they can. And that's been basically the Christian Reformed Church. The Christian Reformed Church is very much, at least in terms of um, the consensus of the moderates in the Christian Reformed Church. And you see those tensions in the Human Sexuality Report and some of the dynamics behind it within the Christian Reformed Church. But but this this is the drift. These are the currents in the stream. And and people get very sensitive to them. And so they they. they and so they tend to watch. Now, again, I'm continuing to read Wellman's High on God, and what's been so interesting about the chapter I was just reading is that when I came back to North America in the late 90s, I took, I accepted the call to this congregation, and when I got here, the council told me that our entire classes as a group had basically made a deal with Christian Reformed Home Missions, and every church was invited to send a team to Willow Creek for their church. It wasn't the leadership conference. It was sort of their main conference. And so what Willow Creek, what Willow Creek did was Willow Creek had basically their seven-step method, how to invite unchurched Harry to church. And you had all of these basically orthopraxis, we might say, in the liberation theology camp. And what what's amazing, what, what I really enjoy about this book, is on one hand, the book is sort of like you would find 20 years after a lot of transformation in contemporary worship, you'd find some journalist somehow, for some reason, having stumbled into a, um, a seeker-sensitive church, being shocked that there was drums in contemporary music. And it's like, we've had drums in contemporary music for a long time in church, okay? So that, that, that wave is old. But what's amazing about the book is not only is he basically going through all of the, all of the best practices if you want to grow your church points that I was basically, I read a lot of those books in the late 90s, um, we tried some of those things at Living Stones. Most of them failed dramatically. <laughs> because if you walked into Living Stones, it wasn't like walking into Willow Creek or Saddleback. 
Uh, if you got greeted, you might be a little shocked by the person who's greeting you. <laughs> and then, of course, the pastor has you got this crazy pastor and yeah, there's a lot of weirdness about living stones. Um, and I, I've mentioned it many times on the channel, people come and visit the church and they're kind of like, is this okay? Are we safe? Yeah, you'll, you'll be okay. I'll keep an eye on the, I'll keep, I, I know who's dangerous and I, I got my eye on them. Just don't come the week I'm not here. <laughs> That's when things happen. So anyway, Bill Hybels, Rick Warren, Church Growth Movement established the mega church orthopraxis in the 80s and 90s. Enthusiastic, welcoming, and really, and I think I, I really liked how the book framed this. A lot of now, now we're going to start playing with some of these. Um, we're going to play with some of these holy words, these buzzwords. I'm going to call it soft inclusion, because there's many ways in which the theologically conservative seeker movement that basically told churches they didn't have to change their core denominational theology in order to be a part of the Willow Creek Association. Again, in the 80s and 90s, basically the seeker movement did what neo-evangelicalism did in the 50s and 60s. Okay, They in many ways were the heirs of neo-evangelicalism in terms of exactly what they were doing, but it was applied. It wasn't like the Billy Graham crusades where, you know, churches had to sort of implicitly adopt these things. Bill Hybels and Rick Warren, Rick Warren had the four bases that you run around. Bill Hybels had his seven steps, um, you know, the, the and all kinds of, we still have some of those. I think I just threw out a whole bunch of the tapes and CDs that we got for years being members of the Willow Creek Association. And, and you know, there were, but there was a ton of stuff, most of which, Wellman talks about in his book. And what's cool about his book is he connects it to the psychological and sociological research that basically says this is why this works in people. Now, I think part of what happened in the seeker movement, certainly there were some social scientists looking at things. A lot of what they did was simply borrow from business because a lot of this was the application of business practices. This is something I could talk about for a long time, but I'm not going to right now. So a lot of that study was behind it, and business had done it, and the church kind of adopted it, and then there was just simply a lot of trial and error, and churches very quickly figured out what would do in order to grow and get the kinds of dynamics that, that Wellman sort of deconstructs in his book and says, these are the psychological and sociological reasons why these things work. But in there, there's a ton of soft inclusion. You know, the dressing down, the dressing down of the pastor, um, that you don't have to dress up to come to this church. Early days in seeker churches, you had a little, you had a little skit or a drama that, that sort of gave the intro to the sermon. We were, we had our pastor's cluster meeting yesterday and, and poor Josiah, those of you on the discord know Josiah, you know, Josiah has the world's worst timing in order to be a church planter because how do you meet all these people in the middle of a pandemic when you can't meet anyone? So that's a whole nother story. But all of this stuff that church planting has done, a lot of it is just soft inclusion. Um, clothing, you don't have to dress up to go to church. Back during the seeker days, you send out flyers. And one of the things your flyers always said, church isn't going to be boring. And one of the interesting things about Nadia Bowles Weber, Mark Driscoll, Nadia Bowles Weber, before she was a pastor, she was a stand up comedian. That's not incidental because pastors in this new framework have to be stage celebrities. They have to have a good sense of humor. They have to be humorous. They have to be engaging. They all also have to be likable and they have to be relatable. And that's a very different thing from having your priest up on high. And I mean, you can see some of that in me. Jacob is still waiting for me to wear a clerical collar. You know, sometimes I see the value of that move because an exchange happened in the seeker movement where they basically, because they sensed the loss of authority. Again, George Marsden writes about this quite nicely in in his book, The Twilight of the American Enlightenment, pastors implicitly 
understood the loss of positional authority that the church had in the decline of Christendom. And so they decided instead of the move from above, they would move from below. And so there's a lot of soft inclusion. You take down the crosses. You have your you have a, basically a plain auditorium. What they were dealing with in many ways were baby boomers who had still grown up in churches that had liturgies and symbolism and statuary. And they had, because of the changes in the culture through the counterculture, now the seeker church was an accommodation to that. And as Bill Heibel said, before we had any of this conversation about safe spaces, Bill Heibel said, we're going to create a safe space for a dangerous message. That was Bill Heibel's shtick. He had a lot of those little sayings. So there's a lot, there's a ton of soft inclusion in high on God. Now, a lot of mega churches, not mega churches, a lot of mainline churches, they never went down this road. Some of them may be a little bit with Robert Schuller, because of course Robert Schuller pioneered this before Hybels and actually the second episode of The Rise and Fall of Marcel. I thought that was a good section. Um, Cosper knows his stuff in terms of in terms of a lot of these things because he lived a bunch of it. And that, of course, the, the seeker movement then begets the emergent movement and the emergent movement, you continue to have the sort of the pushing away of the main line from the evangelicals. But, but within the church, it's evangelical staples. You have personal holiness in life. You have pietism applied and, in fact, disciplined, enforced pietism. Um, you had Biblicism. The Bible is at the center of everything. You had conversionism. It was all about a change in someone's life. And you had religious zeal. The real thing, you know, part of what separates the main line from the, ev from the evangelicals and the seekers and the conservative Christians is the mass deployment of emotional zeal. And Wellman gets this right as well. Now, now, the main line has continued to, to evolve, and again, that, that article that I've pointed to in many of my videos about how the civil rights movement changed the main line, the white main line church. Now, they continue to embrace diversity, inclusion, and equity, and those are the new words. Now, of course, you put them in that order and you just turn them into an acronym, and it's D-I-E, and that's pretty much what the main line church has been doing. And you would think, now, wait a minute, in with the rise of multiculturalism in this vast American country with ethnic diversity and historic rates of immigration and everything that we have going on here, certainly those must be a winning strategy for churches. And in fact, for many per people on the street, if you would say, we want a monocultural, exclu exclusivistic, hierarchical church, People would say, no, that sounds evil because diversity, inclusion, and equity all are sort of in moral alignment with them. But there's a ton of soft exclusionisms in the mainline church that Wellman and the Seekers pointed out. I, Before we went overseas, my wife and I were at an organization in Detroit called Missionary Internship where we did some cross-cultural training, yada, yada, yada. That Sunday, they wanted to take us to a, a cultural experience, so they took me to a black church. It's like, this isn't the cross-cultural experience for me. <laughs> um, but then they took us to a Lutheran church. And, of course, my wife, um, her father was a Lutheran, a mainline Lutheran pastor. And so she grew up, the first third, she, threw, she grew up in a Lutheran church. And so we visited that Lutheran church and there was stand up, sit down, say this, say that. The liturgy had been basically become the rhythm of the people for generation after generation. My wife went into that Lutheran church. She knew exactly what to do. Stand up, sit down, say this, say that. I came in as a rather plain church Christian reformed guy who had grown up in a black community that was sort of trying to deal with African-American liturgy and the Christian Reformed liturgical tradition, and Northside was sort of a mess that way. I mean, when I first had my first conversation with Jonathan Majot, he asked about my liturgy. I said, it's a mess, and it, it it's a mess. I come by it honestly because my father's church's liturgy was a mess. And so I went into this Lutheran church, and I didn't know what to do. And now Wellman makes the point that 
you know, if someone is coming into your church and they don't know what to do, they feel uncomfortable. And, well, now we get into a consumer culture because businesses have figured out how to accommodate us so well. Now, there's always a reaction to these things, too. And I sort of like businesses and obviously churches that are not terribly seeker friendly and a little hard to figure out and maybe a little threatening and a little. I like that. But that's just me. Most people don't. So you go into a mainline church and when to stand, when to sit, what to say, you know, all of the liturgical stuff, dress a certain way, have us vote for a certain party. Part of what's really interesting what comes out in George Yancey's studies are just how exclusivistic the inclusivists are. Now, the way that the IDW has rolled out and all the stuff, that's that comes as no surprise to any of us. But when, you know, when Hillary Clinton utters the word basket of deplorables, that's not inclusion. You, you just basically are despising people. And, you know, a big, a big part of what came through in the Rob Henderson, Jordan Peterson video was, well, people pretty much figure it out very quickly when you look down upon them. And right now in our culture... Most statistics say you will be rejected by, let's say, a boyfriend or a girlfriend's family more for having the wrong political party than for having a different color skin. And what's really interesting is that the Democrats are worse at this than the Republicans. And that's completely understandable because in many ways, politics has become the religion of many who vote for the Democratic Party. That is their religion. And religion is a level up from where politics should be, even ask a guy like David Brooks. So this diversity, inclusion, equity will naturally create antibodies. And it doesn't mean that the people are bigots or mean or anything else, any force that you introduce into the body politic will create antibodies. It's just a question of the the system. Systems desire equilibrium and status quo. And so when you push something in, you'll get a reaction. It won't necessarily be equal and opposite, but there will be a reaction. And so once you name it, you invoke its opposite. Specific stable identity is, by definition, non-diverse. And this is the irony of identity. And this is part of the reason we're seeing fluid identities increasingly become the nature. Because if your highest ideal is diversity, you can't maintain one single identity because that identity is, by definition, exclusive. If you're one thing, you're not another. You can't be two, three, four things at once within the same frame of reference. So specific stable identity is by definition non-diverse, non-inclusive, and non-equal in a combinatorial explosive way. We had a meetup on Monday night, and we hadn't had a local meetup for a while, and I had put it on meetup.com, and we had some new people, and one of the first words out of one of the guys was, you're taller than you are on YouTube. Yeah, I am. I'm part of the tall club. Okay? Statistically speaking, I'm in the single digit category in terms of height in American society. I just am. That's non-diverse, that's non-inclusive, and it's certainly not equal. Reality is like that. And so there are going to be natural tensions with this strategy, and we're seeing them in operation. It comes, should come as no surprise. The real critical factor of the evolution of the main line, though, seems to be the passion gap. And again, one of the points that Wellman makes exactly right in his book is that religion is about passion and emotion and motivation. It is not fundamentally about logic and abstract categories. Those certainly get involved and people can be passionate about them, but it is about the passion and the real difference between the evangelicals 
And the main line is the passion gap. Democrats, well, that's not exactly true. If your church is passionate about something other than your church and the thing around which your church centers, your church is going to lose that energy. And if you lose that energy, you're going to lose people, you're going to lose volunteer, you're going to lose money. And again, the passages I read out of Wellman's book for um, the video that I did about morality, which I posted on Wednesday, September 2021, that was yesterday, or actually it got posted this morning. Well, this is the way it's going to lay out. YouTube served up for me Andrew Clavin this morning, who had about a seven-minute screed about his difficulties on finding a church in Nashville. That really made me laugh, because you would say, Nashville? I mean, it seems like everyone in the world I know is moving to Nashville. I now have friends in Nashville. You know who you are. And... Nashville now is a place that I'd like to visit at that at some point and visit my friends. And I'm sure some of you would love to take me into your home and, um, you know, sort of like Warren did in Australia, spend lots of time talking, which is what I do. So Andrew Clavin moves to Nashville along with all of Daily Wire and can't find a church. And the, the thumbnail on his video is pretty hilarious, too. But now... He, in some ways, is acting like a religious consumer. And again, this is what a lot of churches have been working on. No church can be all things. No individual church can be all things to all people. It doesn't work this way. This is part of the dogma of the church growth movement. Now, if you read Clavin's, I loved his spiritual autobiography. I thought that was a beautiful book. It was a beautiful book. And so, you know, at the end of his spiritual autobiography, he joins the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I'm sure there are Roman Catholic churches in Nashville. Maybe none of them suit him. Because part of often what happens with a religious conversion is that there's, part of the reason you converted is that there was a good match probably with a church or a clergy or some people in the church in the place that you're living that match can't necessarily be duplicated in another city. And I know many of you, we've talked about it before, and I had a very interesting conversation with, I want to say Sarah. Sorry if I get your name wrong. Um, but finding a church is very, very difficult. And of course, I mean, Andrew Clavin's going to be really allergic to anything that he sees as woke. And... What was also interesting about his video, he he called out Tish Harrison Warren, something that he read by her, and part of what was interesting about the video was he obviously isn't a sort of a pastoral clergy insider because Tish Harrison Warren is a very hot number in the Anglican church. He's an Anglican. And the Anglican church is sort of the sweet spot of American hotness that is trying to deal with Emer trying to deal with all of this stuff. But I don't know how I don't know how well Andrew really understands how radically diverse now, of course, the American Anglican Church is a split off of the Episcopalians over same sex marriage, but they do ordain women priests. Depends on the bishop. Because just yesterday at our cluster, we have one guy who participates in our cluster who at one point was part of the PCA and then was part of the, the Presbyterian Church of America and then was part of the RCA, the Reformed Church of America, and now is an Anglican priest. And he's still part of our local church cluster, basically, because PCA, especially RCA, is very close to the CRC. Anyway, so... Yeah, American Anglican Church, the Nigerian church that meets on our facility on Sunday afternoons, another Anglican church. Um, I know some Christian Reformed ministers that if the Christian Reformed church sort of falls apart, they'll be thinking seriously about joining the Anglicans. 
that's sort of where things are right now in sort of the American church scene. But now maybe Clavin has found a particular priest in a particular diocese that, that really suits him because he also sort of calls out um, Karl Barth, calls him a liberal, which is neo-orthodox, which I understand why you want to call him liberal. My systematic prophet, Calvin Seminary, who... When he was a student in Germany, gave Karl Barth a ride to the airport and still told us stories about it in our theology classes. He called him a liberal too, but technically neo-orthodox. And But, you know, who can expect Andrew Claven or any other church shopper to have this much, this many detailed files about the background of who's who in the ever-swirling world of church self-consciousness? So he landed Anglican. But it's fascinating because things continue to get more and more complex. And uh, I, 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 I found, I found Clavin's screed actually quite amusing. But the performance difference. Now, now again, Clavin is going to go to church. He is a committed Christian. He is a conservative Christian. He's a convert. Generally speaking, few people, you know, as clergy, and especially even in an evangelicalish or evangelically sensitive or conservative, moderate denomination like ours, we love converts and we love being part of Christian conversion. As Calvinists, we believe this is fundamentally God's work. But we certainly love to play midwife. But also as pastors, we know you got to kind of keep your eye on converts because they can get really zealous. And so Andrew Clavin's going to church. And he's going to be very particular about what he finds. I was also amazed at how often he said the gospel. You would almost think he would land in a PCA with as much as he used that. And when I say that, it's because the Gospel Coalition, John Piper... Um, Tim Keller, Mark Driscoll. I mean, the new Restless and Reformed, the gospel was really a buzzword and it was a holy word for, and there was a certain set of substitutional, substitutionary atonement presuppositions and a whole culture and orthopraxis that was part of that. So to hear Clavin say that time and time and time again in even the little seven minute video, I thought, this is fascinating because, again, I read a spiritual memoir and I really enjoyed it. And to, to get this kind of transparency about what's going on in churches. And part of the issue is because it's Nashville and all of these tensions, excuse me, all of these tensions are getting played out in evangelicalism now. So fascinating. Now. Clavin has passion. Clavin is committed. He is going to attend a church. He is going to support it financially. He is going to attend faithfully. He is going to be willing to part to volunteer. He is going to be willing to be available for leadership, depending on how that particular tradition does leadership. I should have a conversation with him about the ups and downs of ecclesiology with respect to all kinds of things, because the question of to what degree churches slide liberal and secular with respect to forms of ecclesiology is fascinating. The sort of non-denominational, making it up as you go along, like at Mars Hill in Seattle, or a rigid hierarchy, hierarchy that will have a bishop and... Bishops, so so the, the Anglican priest in our little group yesterday was complaining about the bishop because here uh yeah, I won't I won't I won't air these things on here because it's not the place, but it's complaining about the bishop. Because if you have a bishop, the bishop says yes, the bishop says no, you've got to submit. If Andrew Claven did a little bit more reading from Tish Harrison Warren about her relationship with her bishop, um if you go with the bishop, you really gotta submit. And if you decide not to submit to the bishop, you got to find either a new diocese or a new denomination. But even be, that were set this way in America, it's 
consumerism is sort of sort of like postmodernity and protestantism after a certain point in the historical flow it's nearly inescapable for 80% of the population so this performance difference is in many ways the real difference between the conservative Christians and the progressivists because, and as we continue to dig deeper into Yancey's work, that will become more and more clear and our resolution will get higher and higher on these areas. You would think pervasive secularism and moral political alignment would make the main line an easy sell, but it's a flop. Many are coasting on conservatives that remain. There are many conservative Christians who remain in mainline denominations. That's just a fact. Again, that video I referenced from Ready for Harvest. You know, you can find PCUSAs, uh, United Methodist Churches, Union Churches, United Church of Canada. You can find these churches spread throughout North America. Episcopalian churches, they're all over the place. And in these churches, there remain conservative Christians. They're still out there. There are pietists, there are people, and, and even whole congregations that are that way. They just never, as long as the denomination didn't start getting too tyrannical with respect to a whole bunch of things, they would just sort of stay in it, especially when... You've got some denominations like the PCUSA that will fight you over your church building if you try to leave, and then you have to pay for it twice. Especially a lot of smaller churches with older buildings will look at this and say, it's not worth the effort. A lot of people will have left those churches already, though, too, and gone to evangelical churches or more conservative churches. And and part of this also sort of spreads out in terms of personality profiles, some people, it's just a matter of habit and pattern. So you have customs, habits, commitments to a specific community of friends, family, nostalgia. They've, they, they, they were raised PCA, they'll always be PCA. They were raised Lutheran, they'll always be Lutheran. You've got a lot of people like that. They don't much care about the theology. They don't much care what the preacher says. They don't much care... They don't want a lot of change because they're used to the change. And so if you don't muck around with the liturgy too much and if you don't offend them too much, they'll just continue to kind of float along. And they'll they'll give some money, maybe a lot of money, but they'll they'll just still be there. So there's a lot of those people in in these very large mainline congregations. But as it goes through intergenerationally, they'll disappear. This is a quote from George Yancey's book. Theologically progressive Protestants exhibit more social distance from conservative Christians than from politically progressive non-Christians. A little bit later, I'm going to read a quote from Yancey. Part of what I think Yancey gets right, whereas High on God gets the emotion question right, Yancey gets the meaning question right. And as Yancey tries to figure out Okay, how can I, he's a social scientist, he wants to establish his categories. How can I get my categories right? Well, what Yancey's going to do is find certain tells, and this is one of them. Conservative Christians have more tolerance for progressive Christians, that's why they continue to be conservative Christians in progressive mainline denominations, than progressive Christians have tolerance for conservative Christians. And there's actually been a situation in the United Methodist Church where a few years ago the United Methodists had a big fight over same-sex marriage. Now, ecclesiology matters in these things because different churches handle national borders in different ways. The United Methodist Church, sort of like the Roman Catholic Church, is a global church. So their denomination, the Christian Reformed Church, straddles one border, the United States and Canada. Not many big issues. Uh, the Christian Reformed Church of Cuba is separate. The Christian Reformed Church of the Dominican Republic is separate. Uh, Christian Reformed Churches in Puerto Rico, I believe, are part of Classis Florida, but you don't need a passport to go between countries. So, but the United Methodist Church had a lot of churches in Africa. And so when it came for voting on the question of same-sex marriage, 
the African churches plus enough conservatives in the United States and on other parts of the world had more votes than the American progressives. That doesn't mean you don't have bishops in the United Methodist Church who are progressive. And one of my friends on CRC Voices was sending news about a progressive bishop who is basically breaking church rules in order to really beat up on a conservative Korean church in the United Methodist denomination. And the, 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 the progressive bishop was basically trying to get the conservative pastor of the Korean church thrown out. Part of what you have to look for in this is that I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine who was complaining that Christian Reformed Church leadership is conservative, and it's like, no, Christian Reformed Le Church leadership is almost always moderate to progressive. In many cases in the Christian Reformed Church, pastors are a little bit more progressive than their local churches. It's, depending on your ecclesiology, often the bulk of the membership will be more conservative than the leadership. And so this guy who wants to take out a Korean pastor, well, he's going to have to face the congregation. And here's the thing. Congregations can walk. And they will walk with their bodies. They will walk with their money. You, 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 this sort of veil of habit, custom, friends, nostalgia, you can only push that so far and then people say, enough, I'm out. And when you've done that, you've created a reactive energy or even spirit within the group that you're actually sort of fueling the resistance against your political global effort. And, and part of what I think we're seeing in the church is, in many places, some elements reaching critical mass. And so with that, you tend to get polarization. Now, this, this paragraph from Wellman's book was fascinating. Indeed, as the senior member of the team, I went into one of, one of two black megachurches where my wife and I were the only white people in the sanctuary. Not terribly diverse. That's the American black church. And again, as I've said before, the dynamics for the American black church are very different from many other denominations. Um, and that's for very important historical reasons. We were immediately greeted as if we were long lost friends. And then they reached out to us afterwards inquiring whether we were visitors. Not only was it friendly, but there was a gripping sense of urgency in the singing and the ritual life. And the preaching made you want to be with these people. One of the highlights was the testimony of a young, Mac, a young black man, a former drug user and a dope dealer who had struggled with homelessness and who had been saved. Now, Wellman put scare quotes in there. And, okay, he knows his audience. And Wellman's more over on the mainline side of things, okay? And so he understands a fudgy word, a conflicted word, a buzzword, a holy word, when he sees it. Now, in many places, there wouldn't be any cognitive dissonance about that word. We're going to talk about that word, because actually that word is central to bringing together a few of my last videos. He had recently found his gift in his voice. He was invited to sing. He opened his mouth, and the church began to De, um, devolve into a delirium of joy. The sheer volume and velvet quality of his voice was overwhelming. The congregation responded with deep adoration and adulation. Further on, adding to the moment, it was also graduate Sunday, and every graduate from the junior high up to the, up to the graduate school students came up. I counted 58 individuals, a lot of youth in that church. Each was invited to tell what they had done and then graduated with flowers and ovations. And again, in a black church, this is all very standard stuff. Um, people getting saved in prison, music. Um, so our bulletin se secretary here at Living Stones is technically a member of two churches. So she's still a member of her black church and she's a member of this church. And there'll be Sundays in which, while my mom will watch three Sundays, will watch three churches on Sunday 
via streaming because everybody's streaming now because of the COVID, my church secretary will sometimes go to two or three churches on a Sunday, at least before COVID she would. And she's been church secretary of a number of church things. And when we needed a bulletin secretary, she wanted the job. And, and you know, she's terrific at all of these things. You know, on Mother's Day, she'll have little things for the bulletin. On Father's Day, she'll have another little gift for the fathers. She's really, really good at this stuff. And when you go to a black church, and if you're around a black church, you see black churches are often really good at this stuff. If different churches have different traditions, and they pay attention to different aspects of things within the churches. They all have their own cultures. All of this created a shared mood between my wife and I and the rest of the congregation. As we were leaving our car, we were breathless with joy of their service and its clear relevance to the lives of those in church and the immediacy of their acceptance and care for each other and for us. This is an illustration of his point about welcoming. It's a very interesting story at the beginning of the book where he's going to a mega church and you know this is a guy who's been in church for years and he found the altar call, call so persuasive he found his legs carrying him there he's like why am i going to the front and responding to the altar call so this is a fun book now why did he put scare quotes on saved now that's the language and within a conservative church everybody knows what that means buzzwords are holy words Saved means, means what? Well, it means he's going to heaven when he dies, right? He's saved from hell. Okay, there's a frame. It's not the only frame, but there's a frame. But now pay attention. What else is true of this young man? Former drug user and dope dealer who had struggled with homelessness. So his conversion not only saved him from the judgment of God, speaking in a conservative Protestant frame. But that very same conversion, go back on my videos where I comment on Jordan Peterson talking with David Nasser, the, the after event from that very interesting Liberty University assembly. What do you mean by saved? It's a transformation, okay? And it's a multi-layer layer transformation. And Heidelberg Catechism talks about this. If you're changed from above, your life below has to be changed too. If the transformation is authentic, it is a transformation that happens in your status with God, which will, event, which will impact your life now and your life in the age to come. Now, I'm starting to modulate some of these frames because... How am I going to say this? If you read enough church history, you realize that languages and cultures always frame these things differently. But there are patterns to the framing that hold true through the transformations of culture. And so, young man, black church, got into trouble with the law, trouble with drugs, trouble with homelessness, gets saved. What does that mean? It means... He's clean from drugs. It means he's getting a job. It means he's cleaning his room. He's getting his life in order. He's he's probably, I mean, the church is going to want him to marry. I mean, the black church is astoundingly important for the African-American community. African-Americans by capita are the most Christian, most churched demographic in America. People forget that. They vote Democratic. People forget that too. People often don't understand why my history of voting is democratic. It's because I grew up in a black community. Now you might complain about that, and there are black, you know, Larry Elder ran for governor for the Republicans, yada, yada, yada. These things are always swirling around, but this is the history, okay? Saved means all of these things that in many ways maps fairly well onto Jordan Peterson. Remember the little clip I played from Hitman Heart? That woman talking about, in some ways, how Hitman saved her? Watch Titanic. Listen carefully to what Rose says about Jack. He saved me in every way a woman can be saved. Now, 
That statement is going to mean different things if you are an ardent secularist who is working in the iron box of secularism or if you at least have a two-level cosmology or this life is a front door into lives to come, if that is the worldview you are inhabiting, these words mean different things. This week I'm preaching on the rest of Acts 16. And these are some of the most fun stories in the New Testament and in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul goes to Philippi. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. It's a python spirit. It was sort of like Delphi. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us. Luke is obviously with them. It's It's at least Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, it's fun reading commentaries across the theological spectrum. This particular commentary um, from a publisher in Nashville, uh, written by John Polehill, notes quite rightly, now you're seeing this more and more in contemporary po- uh, commentaries, I don't know if F.F. F. Bruce would have made this observation. His commentary is down there by my desk. I'll have to look it up. How would the audience have understood the way of salvation? Contemporary, even conservative commentators have a lot more cultural sensitivity than they used to 40, 50 years ago. I can read that in the commentaries. What would a Gentile audience have understood by what this woman was saying? Saved from what? Saved by whom? Who is the Most High God? Is it Zeus? You're in Philippi. Philippi, of course, was founded by Philip of Macedonia in the Thracian region. So there's a lot going on there, lots of layers. What do they mean by saved? Well, Paul turns around, casts out the demon. Her owners are ticked off because she was making a lot of money for them. Paul and Silas get cast into prison. Read Acts 16. It's great stories. What was she saved from? What's the New Testament framing of this? And, you know, I'm usually working with those frames and playing around with them in my sermons to try to get people to not only connect a little bit better historically with the text, but also modulate some of the framing of this in our world today. Because the frames keep changing, but you can see a lot more by watching the patterns. And this is where I want to pull in the ideals instantiated and the re-idealized to stitch to stitch heaven and earth. When that young black man tells his church tells his story in church and talks about being saved, it means things on the ground. If you go back, if you listen to Roland and Peugeot's conversation, see my video before about marriage equality, death of the Protestant Church. I talked a lot about ideals. Their conversation, they very much emphasized the ideals need to be instantiated in saints. That's right. They need to be. But that sainthood is by definition hagiographic. Sainthood is a hagiographic word because you're taking a fulano, a John Doe, a Jane Doe, a normal human being, and you're, 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 transforming their identity. So when that young man gives his testimony in front of the church, as many of you who know who have been to churches that really took in testimony giving as part of the liturgy of the church, why did that become such a part of the liturgy of the church? If you give your testimony in front of the church, you tell a shaped story. And this is some of the cynicism of people who may be sitting back and listening to testimonies and the the little mini episode of the rise and fall of Mars Hill 
where he's talking about really the hagiography of church planters. We talked about that in our cluster yesterday, yesterday because again, poor Josiah is going to plant a church, and 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 um, and the other two church planters were sort of rolling their eyes at church planting hagiography. Because, yeah, Rick Warren, you read Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren moved down to Southern California with his family in the back and started going door to door. And this church won't be boring. This church will have meaning. This church will have relevance. And before you know it, had, you know, 25,000 people. Uh, not really. He was networked into the Southern Baptist Church. And he was one of their brightest and best. And there's a lot going on there. Same with Tim Keller's story in New York City. Same with Bill Hybel's story. Bill Hybel's planted Willow Creek out of a an already very large church and an extremely successful youth group. And he basically graduated the youth group into a church plant. And so poor people who read the hagiography about church planting and drive up with their family in a minivan and start going door to door and two, three years later are out of money. And what does Rick Warren have that I don't have? He probably had a lot more, a lot more of a lot of things. So better networks, better money, better support, maybe better education, maybe more gifts. A lot of church planters fail. It's very unusual that a church planter will get up above 200. Very unusual that they'll plant a mega church. And again, this is part of the interest in the rise and fall of, of Mars Hill. Mark Driscoll had a lot of gifts, very unusual gifts, had them exceptionally. I mean, the fact that he can start another church with 2,000 members in it after <laughs> what happened in Seattle in the age of the internet? Wow, he's an exceptionally gifted man. And to have evangelicals wringing their hands, we don't know if he should. Well, you know, you kind of live and die by your ecclesiology. But, you know, let's say a group of CRC people want to get Paul Vanderclay out of the Christian Reformed Church, you know. Well, then Paul Vanderclay goes and leverages his massive YouTube following and starts a mega church, you know, without continuing to repeat the politically correct lines about Jordan Peterson or, you know, refusing to associate with John Verveke or even someone who carves graven images. Jonathan Peugeot with the Babylon Bee peeps. This pattern has to continue. Why is the mainline church so weak? Why is there so little why is there so little power? Why can't they muster the energy even of Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or Muslims? Why is secularized religion always a failure? It's because it lacks the power of heaven. Well, what do I mean by that? A lot of you would say, that's exactly right. And if you were in my Bible study and you gave me an answer like that, I'd say, tell me what you mean. And many of you would probably, as C.S. Lewis noted in, pa in Miracles, give me a story which you basically take the, the narrative of the Bible with the character. It's because the power of Holy Spirit comes from heaven to change the lives and hearts of people. And I would say, Amen. What are these sociologists and psychologists like Jordan Peterson and James Wellman and George Yancey doing? When we talk about the molecules of the water that stacks up in the Red Reed Sea so Israel can cross on dry land or the Jordan River or the spirit that Paul casts out with a word, what are the molecules? What is the matter? What is the spirit that shapes that matter? The keys of the kingdom. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. The ideal, the instantiation that participates in that ideal, the hagiographic dynamic that swirls around the ideal, energizes the community, 
moves their heart, moves their lives, moves their passion. When that man is saved, it's like, yeah, you know, getting off drugs and not selling and having a better network. And again, George Jordan Peterson, when he talked to when he talked to um, David Nasser, Jordan Peterson studied alcoholism. Why does AA work? Even if you desiccate it to a higher power, why does it work? It works because of this. Well, Paul, are you deconstructing it? Are you reducing it to just a psychological or sociological dynamic? No. Just in the way, well, if the water piles up on each side of the Jordan, it's still water. Spirit moves matter. Spirit moves us. saved must be instantiated in the flesh. And this is Christian dogma. You can read it in the Heidelberg Catechism. You know, Tim Keller loves to say you are cra- you are um you are saved by faith alone, but not by faith which is alone. Well, what does he mean by that? It means that it means what Protestant theologians and Christian priests and clergy have been saying when God moves in your life things have to change if things if there's no evidence in your life that heaven has moved we're going to be skeptical and in fact everyone knows this and it plays into cynicism that's why there's a different valence when Ravi Zachariah gets massages than when Bill Clinton has his Monica Lewinsky episode. There's different valences. And there's even different valences why Al Franken and Governor Cuomo stepped out of office and Donald Trump didn't. And of course, well, because there are spirits working in the communities. And there are different dynamics working in the communities. And we can describe them sociological, but... Here's the funny thing. It's always... The rise and fall of Mars Hill is a terrific example. Terrifically gifted, rhetorically genius guy. You know, serious believer in many respects. Some critical flaws. And the thing falls apart. As I mentioned in my previous video... You know, it would have been clear if he had had a sexual affair with someone in the church. You know, bang, done. That wasn't it. It was authoritarian. It was angry. It, it didn't sort of have the culture of Christ. And, and this is where, this is where, where Wellman's idea that I talked about earlier is really key. There, it has to be minimally counterintuitive. It's got to be counterintuitive enough to raise your salience, but if it's too much, it just blows it out. It's got to be just right. And, and that's, you know, there's similar dynamics about map territory, unmapped territory. You've got, you know, McGill Christ's master and his emissary. All of this is going on. Saved must be instantiated in the flesh. Hagiographic impulse sees it happening in the heavenlies. Powerful, emotional, imaginative, motivational engines that power activity. Without this, you're not going to have a religion. Without this, religions, good or bad, are going to take your people in. So I did my conversation with Nick this week, and it was a lovely conversation. I was really happy to meet Nick and to be able to talk with him. And so this is his article that he wrote in Christian Courier a number of years ago. But note where Nick is in the spectrum. Now, again, some of you who will look at Nick's position on this issue. Now, these issues are always tells, but I don't tell you the whole thing. You're always going to have, well, are these transitional figures? Might be. Will Nick's grandchildren and great-grandchildren have the same kind of perspective that Nick has? 
Hard to say. There are trends. Christian Reformed Church is pretty clear. I think the average age in the Christian Reformed Church right now is in its mid-50s. It's the average age of a Christian Reformed Church member. I, in many places in the Christian Reformed Church, am on the young end of this spectrum. And that would make sense because the age is in the mid-50s. That's where I am. But he ends his article in this way. The purpose of life is the perfection of the soul. Now, those of you who want to learn to do conversations the way I do, don't stop at every point where theologically you might want to add nuance or correct or change within the flow of a conversation. It just mucks up the conversation. You don't get anywhere. Usually with a conversation, you need to have a goal in mind and or a few goals in mind, and you want to hit those goals, which means you're going to prioritize and lay things aside. What this means is don't be easily triggered because if you're easily triggered, someone's going to hit a trigger and it's going to derail you from your goal for the conversation or the interaction. The purpose of life is the perfection of the soul. This is what he writes. All great world religions agree on this. The soul is perfected through suffering. Our homosexual brother and lesbian sisters suffer more than most normal people. And this is where you get into this equation of suffering. Is the brokenness of the creation more intimately known in them? Do their souls shine a little brighter because they suffer more? On the day Jack died, there was joy in heaven. Did, did, did the angels sing at the homecoming of a child of the covenant? Why would Jack write the article this way? It's because of who he is. It's because of what he believes. Now, not Jack, but of, of Nick. Now, let's imagine Nick didn't believe this. If you, if you read Miroslav Wolf's Exclusion and Embrace, Wolf goes into this. And basically, this is a point I made in a number of my videos a number of years ago. Secularization tends to intensify the emotionality, and also the bloodshed of politics. Why? Because in Jack's opinion, or in Nick's opinion, his brother Jack was done a disservice and an injustice in this world, which can be made up for it in the age to come. Now, you may agree or disagree with Nick on whole realms of things like this, but notice what this affords the conversation within the community. Because, of course, Nick and I might agree or disagree on a whole bunch of things, but God knows and God will get it right and we both trust him. Therefore, Nick and I can have a cordial conversation and hopefully a productive conversation about things that we might disagree on. This added aspect through this whole process, you have an ideal, gets instantiated. There's hagiography around it. To a degree, this piece is a degree of hagiography about Jack's brother, Nick. I'm not taking anything away from it. It's the nature of storytelling. You select and don't select things in order to make a point in the story. Anyone who learns writing, anyone who learns public speaking will learn this dynamic. It's hagiographic by nature, even by virtue of selection. Movies that are based on a true story take even greater liberty. What's the nature of biblical narrative? A lot of this issue in those conversations. That's the nature of storytelling. The fact that Nick includes this in Jack's story is vital for understanding the entire framework for this conversation. That even if Jack was... was was treated unjustly in this life here, God can make up for it because God is good and God is wise. Now, again, there's a world of things that you can talk about here, and I'm not going to go there because I want to make the point I'm making. This dynamic, this young man who is saved, Nick's brother Jack, the testimony in church, any story we tell, the story of the Philippian slave girl who was released from the demon and saved by Paul, who knows what her owners did to her when she was no longer any use for them. Maybe Lydia 
purchased her from the owners at a discount price and set her free. We have no idea. But this is the nature of faith, and it's the nature of the reason why conservative churches have power and secular institutions never do, and why secular politics gets increasingly bloody because all of your enemies, all of your dealings with the enemy have to be done here, and there is no perfectly just God who is actually going to sort things through and make things right in the life of the age to come one way or another. Yancey says this, based on this research, this is the beginning of the book, we highlight here that progressive Christians emphasize political values relating to social justice issues as they determine who is part of their in-group. Why? It's the, it's the continued pressure of secularization on these churches. Now, Nick said a number of times to bring heaven to earth. Now, this was another point in which he said it. Now, I'm a little bit more subject to theological triggers because I'm a pastor, and but I didn't want our conversation to get bogged down in a debate about theology. It's not really fair. Um, I'm trained in theology likely more than he is. I have status in the denomination because I'm clergy, he isn't. Um, we're not sitting in private where we can have a conversation about the nuances of ecclesiology, especially within a Kuyperian framework. But part of the pressure of secularization means that the kingdom must come here and now. And if the kingdom must come here and now, you will turn your political adversary, adversaries into the devil or into Nazis, which is, the, as Tom Holland notes, the, more late, the latest iteration of the devil. That's the, how the dynamic works. Secularization is fueling this process that Jordan Peterson is pointing into, where people's politics are their religion, and that's bad for their politics. David Brooks notes that. Why? Because you need your religion to actually have some more give and take, and some more options so that you can tolerate your political opposition and not kill them or intern them in some re-education camp. And if you lose that political, if you lose that religious realm, you lose that capacity in this world. And this is why, as you get into Yancey's book, it's why conservative Christians can actually be more tolerant of progressive Christians than progressive Christians are to conservative Christians. This comes through clearly, and it makes perfect sense because God will deal with the wobbly Christians as God will. Conservative Christians believe that. Progressive Christians intuitively, instinctively devalue God's judgment at some point. In fact, often, as uh, H. Richard Niebuhr met, um, designated in that little quip that I read in the previous video, God has no judgment at all. And this is, in fact, the point that Miroslav Vols brings pretty forcefully in his book, Inclusion and Embrace. Based on this research, we highlight here that progressive Christians emphasize political values relating to social justice as they determine who is part of their in-group. They tend to be less concerned about theological agreement. Conservative Christians, however, do not put emphasis on political agreement in order to determine if you are one of them. In other words, increasingly there is going to be more political diversity in conservative churches than in mainline churches. This is part of the reason. Um, this is part of the reason Clavin has difficulty finding a church. This is part of the reason that we actually have a lot of political diversity at Living Stones. Now, people who visit the church and really want a church where, thus say we all, as we vote Republican, they're dissatisfied here. Other people are dissatisfied here because. Why isn't Paul outspoken on these particular issues? They're dissatisfied here. Why? 
Now, unlike what Clavin was looking for, I do use political illustrations in my sermons, and those of you watching my rough draft know that. But the reason we can do this is because we believe and have have integrated into our spiritual imagination the life of the age to come, and that positively impacts our capacity to love our neighbor as ourself, all the way up to and including our enemies in this world today. I can love my political adversary. I can love the person I disagree with. I can even worship with them. But wait a minute, you have theological categories. Yes, we do, and they're not political. Do they have political implications? Oh, quite likely. Will we have political conversations? Oh, probably. Will we have theological differences? Probably too. And this is part of the point of why Christianity scales so well is because you actually just have one person at your center, and that's Jesus. And everything else can flow from there. The bottom line we seek to illuminate in this book is that progressive and conservative Christians use entirely different factors in determining their social identity and moral values. Indeed, we argue that the ways in which these two groups deal with questions of meaning are so different that it is time to regard them as distinct religious groups rather than subgroups under a single religious umbrella. And here's the irony. The conservatives will keep trying to play the big tent. It's the progressives that get tyrannical. That's ironic when you say your church is all about diversity, inclusion, and equity, but you've got all this soft exclusivism. And the conservatives that have a fairly exclusivistic theological framework have a lot of soft inclusivism and can actually tolerate more diversity on certain realms than those who fly a flag that say diversity. Indeed, oops. while there are many ways to look at the divisions within Christianity, racial, political, theological, denominational, etc., we will start with the theological divide to explore other implications of the split between Christians. Our aim is to show how is to show both how theologically progressive and conservative Christians define their social and political priorities and how those definitions differ from each other. We also examine how differing social and political aspirations emerge from these theological distinctions. This will get at the question about the nature of the theological divide within Christianity and the degree to which this disagreement leads to distinctive religious groups. That theological divide is related to political divisions among Christians, but it is possible that the issue that separates theologically progressive and conservative Christians are even more fundamental than those political disagreements. And again, Jordan Peterson was doing research on political differences in terms of the big five, five personality profile. Jonathan Haidt in his book, talked about that. You'll find that in different denominations. But I would argue there's probably something built into how church structures, church practices work and how religions are framed that mitigate the differences along the big five personality profile. That would be my guess. Because, again, if you think about when Jordan Peterson is talking about ideologies, ideologies as crippled religions, religions are very big and broad. And what's happening as secularity continues to eat into certain groups, they become more political and less religious. Now, what tends to happen is that it eats through to a certain point and then it flips. And... That flip can be very difficult and painful and sometimes destructive, but this is part of the reason why religion doesn't go away. And it's not going away. It's simply coded in us too deeply. A lot of these conversations turn on time frames. And that's 
when you tell the story about one person in one life that captures all of the what's going on at one moment. And part of what part of what was lovely about my conversation with Nick was he did a beautiful job at the beginning of the video laying out and you know when he's laying it out I could see it. He was talking about the world that this book, My Church, written by Reverend, and they'd put his name right there, Richard DeRyder, and Thea Van Halsema from RBI, then RBC. And this is a really lovely piece of hagiography about the Christian Reformed Church that nicely weds the book of Acts with the Christian Reformed Church in 1967, before the 60s really got a hold of us. This is the world that Nick was talking about. Born in 43. So, 43, 24 years old in 1967. I love the pictures in this book because they're not only so... Well, there's Calvin Seminary built on the new Knollcrest campus. Here's all our little denominational seals. Here's our missionary work in Nigeria. This is what we imagine church going looks like. Now, there's a ton of neo-evangelical stuff beneath the surface that's going to come to the fore here too. After the banner, which was read, a weekly publication of the Christian Reformed Church, the banner, the, the banner editor basically had about as much influence as your local pastor via the platform of a magazine. Well, Christianity Today was being read, as was the Reformed Journal. So all elements of that time frame. That day is gone. It's not coming back. But we human beings live in these little time frames. That's the cyclum. That's a hundred years. And now a cyclum isn't even a hundred years. It's maybe a decade or two. It's a generation. And then it's gone. Our communities, distributed cognition, our principalities, our familial principalities live far longer. And lots of other things count in there too. Secularization, secularization as we know it, hasn't been around that long. Modernity has sort of been creeping in over the last number of centuries, but in terms of human beings, that's not a long time. It might have the process of destroying, well, resurgent Islam. Basically, and we've all had lessons in viruses and antibodies, resurgent Islam has antibodies from modernity. Look at the rest is history. Listen to the rest is history. Retrospective on 9-11. In many ways, Osama bin Laden and those who followed him, these are products of modernity. These were not people that were sort of emerging from the backwoods, back deserts of the Islamic world. These were people who had university educations and they enjoyed watching Western films. And the United States and this massive, this massive multi-billion dollar influence machine was the great Satan that was corrupting the youth. Again, that pattern isn't much different from the pattern of the first century Judean culture war. The Hippodrome, Hellenism, it's corrupting the youth. Some Jews said, get with the program. Other Jews said, over my dead body, literally. Others said, over the dead body of you and your Roman soldiers that are propping you up. But saved, that's really what spawned this video. This is the dynamic. If your worldview does not afford the ideal and the heavenlies that can host it, 
You're going to have crippled religions in this world. And while they might seem powerful for a time and might gain powerful political resonance, well, political regimes come and go. Religions work on a very different clock speed. That's it for this video. Leave a message. Let me know what you think.